Morning, everybody. Today is June fifteenth. Uh, welcome to locally sourced local updates and uh, analysis from the Monadnock region, New Hampshire. Uh, if you could take a moment to subscribe or become a patron, that would be awesome. Um, you know, we're <laughs> we're coming up on the end of of uh, financial assistance here, and um, it will definitely mean a lot to me and hopefully to the community to keep this going and sustain. But um, I'm not here to talk too much about that today. Um, what I want to do today is really like, this is going to be a brief stream. Um, part of the reason I'm doing it is I don't know if I'll be able to get the Thursday stream in this week. So I wanted to sort of try and, and, and this is, this is a pretty big deal. So I wanted to try and get out ahead of it. Um, as I'm sure everybody is well aware, uh, Senator Jean Deitch, uh, from, from here in Peterborough, uh, said some things about education that were, were pretty elitist. Um, and the reality of it is that most of the criticism right now is, um, most of the posts, all that stuff is coming from a very right wing perspective. Um, and I've had some conversations with folks, uh, you know, I don't know a single person that supports what was said here. Um, but I want to kind of, I really want to like try and dive into what it actually means for people who would say they're progressive or, um, or on the left in general, uh, that really just did like, this doesn't sit right. Um, and I want to just sort of give some of my takes on this because I just, it's, it's going to be easier for me to do it here than, than comment threads. They're just, it's never, you know, I don't believe that a Facebook comment thread is the best place to try and do meaningful, uh, meaningful discourse on, uh, on, on a topic like this. So, um, before I really like get into sort of my stuff on it, I want to sorry about that. I'd, I'd like to just pull up the source of this and, um, and examine like what we're what we're actually dealing with here. So we're all sort of working off the same information. I'm gonna probably spend some time talking about learn everywhere as well because it's relevant to this conversation. Um, so this is the article. Uh, well, the second article, I guess, that was published. This is sort of a follow up to the original piece. Um, and attached is the audio from the meeting now it's important to understand this came towards the end of the meeting so we're not listening like we're listening to a snippet here um and very much so a lot of the people that are quoted in these articles come from a position of defense for the learn everywhere program come from a position of defense for homeschooling uh things of that nature and what I'd rather do, you know, like we can talk about that, but what I would rather focus on is the way that this damages um, the argument for public schools. Like this is, we can talk about how, um, how what she said is utterly reprehensible and disgusting. Frankly, I, 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 I am just appalled uh, to hear that language. Um, but I also, you know, for people that know me and I, you know, I've said this publicly, I don't know how many times that I'm a staunch believer in public education, teacher credentialing, 
having a quality standard, right? Um, and I, I, it's my belief that education is the cornerstone of democracy. Um, you cannot have a functioning democracy unless people know what they're talking about, what's going on, how things work, so on. So the the idea that education is crucial to doing good work and really responding to the needs of the people and letting the people have the power is it's crucial but when things are framed in a certain way it's you're it is very possible for us to unwittingly damage the very causes that we're trying to fight for uh when we use inappropriate language to try and deal with that um i'm gonna i'm gonna just play the audio outright um and we'll just we'll go from there okay Okay, hold on. I I got to I got to pause this a little bit because I want to just kind of oh, I want to deal with this a little bit. So she talks about this idea of forcing um forcing non-public school education or forcing like I I you know, she she talks about this concept of like of forcing people to have to make a choice. And um, that's a, a, a sort of a mischaracterization of what's happening. Um, what, you know, maybe, maybe I do take this moment to sort of talk about, um, to talk about learn everywhere. Um, The way, um, the, the biggest problem that I see with Learn Everywhere is it's taking state public school funds and giving it to, uh, business leaders to engage, like, uh, you know, subsidize and engage in workplace trade training programs, right? Um... It seems like a great idea on the outset because it gives you um, it gives students a chance to learn in the field. It gives students a chance to really like engage with stuff. Um, you know, Northeastern College is a good example of a model of this that's like very, very uh, cohesive where the education process is very very deeply tied into work experience and actually being out there and doing doing things um what's important then to distinguish is that like the concept itself is not necessarily a bad one it's the way we decide to engage in it now the key problem here is that um a business owner 
you, you don't have to go through uh, college to become a business owner, right? Like anybody can start a business. That's like the American way. Um, and we absolutely can become credentialed and experienced in our own way through these these institutions, um, you know, these independent businesses. But it's it's not the same as like a, a verification of a certain level of understanding. We're not necessarily sure how much each individual business owner knows or doesn't know about what they need to do in order to teach things. And we're the idea is not to say, no, you can't do that. The idea is to say, we want to see you have to be held to the same standards and put through the same rigors that we would put our public educators through. The amount of effort that one needs to go through to become a public school teacher is pretty incredible. Um, you really got to you gotta invest in an education. You got to know a lot of stuff. You, in a sense, you have to have the money to even get through that door. So there's this, this class dynamic wrapped up in, um, in the ability to get an education, but then it also devalues for those educators all that time and effort and money and struggle that they went through to get that teaching position only to see their student go off and be educated by someone who doesn't have to be held to the same standards and then could come back with some sort of alternate or incomplete understanding of what they might need to know in order to truly and comprehensively engage in that market or that industry or that trade or that skill right that there needs to be a very very strong relationship uh that is held to a non-political standard for maintaining quality right um and when when she's placing certain concepts on a very like high pedestal this you know this this concept of well educated right well what what constitutes well educated um how do we measure well educated jean has a very very specific internal understanding of what that measure is and it's not necessarily consistent with societies. And Jean herself is a is is a wealthy, successful entrepreneur. Her entire campaign was very much so focused around um around business owners and industry and entrepreneurs and so she's she's got this this strong tie in with these folks um but it's all very much so by scale right like um the bigger the business the more influential the business the more valuable that that opinion was to her campaign so for her it's like education and earning money and all of this stuff they're all they're all very wrapped up in a a, a tight cohesive understanding which is not the same for everybody right so i just kind of want to like take a minute to deal with that now there's a lot more that i need to get into here i'm going to keep letting this audio roll i do think
I'm sure there are, um, thank you for the question. And I, I appreciate, of course, that parents um, in a democracy, and particularly in the United States, public education has been the means for people to move up to greater opportunity for each generation to be able to, um, to succeed that much more than their parents have. And, you know, um, you know, my parents, my, my father just graduated from high school, so I really wanted, you know, it's really important to me that I, I went to college or something. And each generation wants more and better for um, their, their kids. When it gets into the details, would my father have known uh, what courses I should be taking? Uh, I don't think so. And I think that it is that ability to, you know, the next generation to move beyond the knowledge of their parents. And I think that's what we offer through the school system. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, Representative Cordell, you still have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, uh, that. Uh, so, uh, parents that are not that well educated uh, cannot make those uh, decisions. Those decisions that fail should be left to a professional. You know, I don't, I don't think the Senator. Say, I don't think the Senator said that. So. Um, and if you I have, thought, if, I thought you did. If your dad is a carpenter and you want to become a carpenter, then yes, listen to your dad. Yeah. All right. We're gonna okay. I we're we're gonna stop it right there. Um. Uh, all right. Yeah. It's you know. I'm gonna pull down to this because I think like a lot of the real like that's that's. I'm sorry, excuse the language. That's fucking awful. <laughs> um, just wow. Um, some of the most intelligent people that I've ever met are carpenters. Um, that's just that's just the truth. And libraries are a public resource. Everybody can go and read a book. Okay, the internet is free in a sense uh, like like once you're there it's free if you're able to have some sort of public access point it's essentially free um but i mean we're i i don't want to confuse the it's incredibly i i mean i pay an exorbitant amount of money for my internet here so i think that's a totally different discussion about the the cost of utility that shouldn't be privatized but that's like like i said it's a really different conversation um and the point more so is that people are capable of educating themselves and to assume that somebody is not educated is a really bad move. Now, this, the thing that I really want to point out here is like, you know, I don't, I'm not going to tell the senator how to, how to fix this because I honestly don't think she can. I don't see there being a way to fix this uh, without her completely disavowing many positions that she's held for a very, very long time. And, you know, like I have and other people have experienced or witnessed her say and do plenty of things that would that, that, that long preclude this statement that that are right in line with it. And, you know, I remember having discussions with people back when she was running in the primary and uh, saying, you know, like, you know, this is really problematic. And people in her staff saying, yeah, we're trying to work on it with her, you know, we're really trying to get her to change that position. And like, you know, this is this is something that the Democrats in this area didn't grapple with. From the outset. The way politics work in this state. Because we just don't pay our public officials nearly anything. Um, is that the wealthier members of our 
you know, our society have a much better foothold and opportunity to seek office, right? So what that means is that the wealthiest members of our towns or our society are the ones that are calling the shots pretty much all the time. And what Senator Deitch has done here is shown us just how far away she's gotten from a working class understanding of the problems with our society. They become sort of a talking point to her, uh, a, a point of reference that she can sort of pin to her lapel as a badge and utilize as a, a, a door pass to get in and say a bunch of things that really are utterly detrimental to the cause. Now, like, I had made a statement, I, you know, I, I think it might be posted publicly or whatever, but um, that this is going to hurt the left in this region for elections to come multiple elections and it's going to hurt down ballot i mean not that there's much down ballot from there but it's going to hurt uh progressives who are looking to hold a select board seat it's going to hurt state reps it's going because the reality is gene made it through a primary against two other candidates one of them had already held this senate seat So, and I'm sorry if people don't want to hear this, but the Democrats are complicit in allowing this type of ideology to continue to be propagated, especially when many of them were very, very, very conscious of this type of thought, this type of elitist thought that Senator Deitch has. And we just let it happen. And for somebody who really just isn't engaged with politics at all, really finds it completely abhorrent and boring and, you know, like they feel stupid when they talk to people about it because everybody just tries to take a high ground. And like, you know, like what this did was send those those voters, people that might have been like, you know, I really like what Bernie Sanders said. You know, I, I really like what he was saying back in 2016. I really like that. I'm not a huge fan of the, the identity politics that he got into in 2020, so I couldn't quite back him on it. You know what I mean? I felt really weird about it. But there was there was some some working class stuff that really, like, really hit the nail on the head. Um, those people will look at this kind of a statement and say, you know what? That's the exact ideology that I had a problem with when Clinton was president. It's the exact same ideology that I had when Barack Obama was president because it's a very top down professional managerial class view of um, of equity or um, or humanity of uh, an an intellectual capability of of the general public. Uh and it's very disenfranchising, right? It's incredibly disenfranchising. And, you know, if we take a look at the opponent, right, that the Republicans are putting up, um, and I'll see if I can dig some of this stuff up really fast. Yeah, okay. Here we go. So, I want to draw folks' attention to this because I think, you know, like, look, I, again, I don't want to get too, too deep into, like, electoral strategy. We could talk about that, too, maybe in a minute. But, um, but I want to sort of stay, you know, I want to stay on this, this more ideological track for a second. So, um, this is the opponent that the GOP is going to run against Senator Deitch in the upcoming election, okay? To receive endorsements from 9 out of 10 GOP members 
in a race where I I've done the searching and I mean I could very well be wrong about this but I I've done the the looking and I don't see anybody else running in that primary. And what that says to me is that after losing Senate District 9, which is an incredibly gerrymandered district, like right like Gene won a blue seat in a district that's like wildly gerrymandered to represent better and maintain the votes of the GOP, right? She, she barely took that seat. And the GOP saw that as like, we got to consolidate, folks. We can't, like, we need that seat back. We really need that seat back. And the candidate that they, they've they got up here is... Um, very like she's kind of a populist man like I'll see if let me try and get her website up here. Um She's you know She's a, a, a council member in her town. I'm sorry for the dead space there, folks, but she, she's a council member in her town. She's, you know, gone out and got involved in food banks. She's cooking for people. She's she's doing a lot of this like groundwork, right? And that's that's populist action, right? That's like I'm gonna get down into the into it with the people, and then I'm really gonna interact with them. And Jean's always kind of had a more like I'm going to go to these meetings with these these leaders and these professionals and we're going to talk about it. And it's very much so it, it, it feels separated, frankly, from from what our experiences as just people living in in the towns and trying to just scrape together our rent or our mortgage or whatever. Like it's that that feels distant. Um, and a candidate like this. Uh, Lake Denise, uh, uh, Ricciardi, I believe is the pronunciation. Excuse me if I'm not, you know, getting it right. But like, the GOP is deciding to play some serious hardball politics here, and is identifying a way to reclaim this district with that the absorbs some of the 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 populism and and liberty of of a previous more right-wing candidate that lost to Deech with a more traditional conservative family oriented type of a, a candidate and that's gonna that's the intent is to is to re for the GOP to rebuild that solidarity with the working class right and to to, to get that that voter who just sees what Deech just said and is like, "Ugh, gross! I can't do that. I can't support that at all." Just categorically, um, that's they're they like in a more high level political strategy way. They're they're getting serious with it, and what I want to sort of like. I don't want to deal with that race really anymore because in a way I think it's a wash. I think the amount that Deech would have to do at this point to really reconcile that difference and like get people to change their minds is just, I, it would require such an incredible ideological shift on her part that I just, I don't, I don't know anybody that's able to, to internalize and consume and, adopt those changes so quickly i just i don't know a human that can do it because it's a process we have to find in in ourselves to understand what's happening now like i gotta you know again we're doing some hopping around here but like 
here's here's what I'm gonna get to now with it is that um they've published this Facebook comment, okay? Because and and something that was like rather than sit down and say, whoa, I really screwed up, uh, Gene's initial reaction was to hop into the Peterborough Town Facebook group and start making posts trying to excuse what she said or uh, contain it or, you know, the say, I, I misspoke. <laughs> I, that never should have been the tactic from the start. Now, um, I will read this aloud uh, for anybody that's that's listening in and not looking at the screen, um, it, here's from her from her Facebook post. It seems that to many people the word educated means more educated than myself. When I was a college student on the south side of Chicago, I volunteered to help the campus minister with a tutoring program at a nearby school. The response was the response to the free after school program was enormous, so the group I was assigned was large. Unfortunately, two two parent volunteers were in my classroom. Or fortunately, rather, sorry. Fortunately, two parent volunteers were in my classroom, so I asked them to take one half of the group while I took the other. But soon I saw that they were not reading with the kids, just sitting there. When I complained to the director afterwards, she said to me, "But honey, they don't know how to read." In a world of privilege, people may think that educated means you have a college degree. What educated means to me? You need to be able to read. So, in this is uh, this is getting into semantics, right? And Jean's trying really hard to redefine the words that she used. She's trying to, to recontextualize it, right? But the problem is there was never a good context for those words, ever. And here, like other posts, she's pulling out anecdotal references that use other people's very difficult experiences uh, and, and challenges as a token to exemplify her argument, right? You know, it's not a whole lot different than saying, well, I can say this, I, I, I can say you're being racist and you shouldn't do that because my friend is black. We don't get to use those stories ever. We don't ever get to use those stories to justify what we say we can use them internally to teach ourselves lessons we can share those those stories with others absent trying to make a point with them S simply to share that that experience right like it's so that we can all learn together but to hold up these anecdotes and use them to justify an argument is using somebody else's experience as a tool to further your own perspective without ever going back and talking to those people about like, what's your stance on this? Do you agree with me? Because that could very well be an appropriation of what those people meant. It's, it's horrible. Okay. What am I going on about here? Well, I don't think the conversation at this point is about Gene Deitch, frankly. I think this conversation is about what the Democrats are going to do if they truly want to be the working class party. If they truly want to represent people who are, are, are challenged by the limitations of education who are challenged by the limitations of economics. The great, great underlier. That's that, you know, it doesn't matter who we are, we're all touched by economics. And we, for some reason, decide that economics and politics are a separate thing. But for most people, they achieve 
a certain degree of economic success through what we permit within our political system. And what this indicates is how far away the Democrats in this region have let themselves stray from the goals and aspirations of the working class. It's why a progressive candidate like Bernie Sanders got to where he got in this day and age. Okay? I remember having a conversation with Gene back in 2016. I told her I, 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 I really liked what Bernie had to say because I... I all of a sudden we had someone who was speaking to all these issues that I just I never felt got addressed and I I could see that the working class strongly identified with him um and when I told Jean that I I like Bernie she literally laughed at me she literally laughed at it and then said oh you've never been to the midwest those people would never But Bernie did pretty well, you know, with 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 working class in the Midwest, if we're being honest with ourselves. Um, we can get into that whole conversation later, like about, you know, how do you deal with with reaching people in the Midwest? But that's not that's not relevant to here um, in a way. That's not that's not our local problem. Um, it's that category. You know, this is where I'm talking about something that happened four years ago. This was an exchange I had four years ago. Actually, five, maybe because uh, like closer to because I believe it was in the winter time when I had this conversation with her. Um, I knew long before she even started to run that she held a certain contempt for for a working class view um that she very much you know like when i thought of what like how do i define a professional managerial class type gene comes right to mind now like i you know i want to be careful that i'm not I'm not after bosses right now and I'll have a uh, I'll ha I'm happy to have a separate economic discussion on a different day about the relationship between bosses and workers and what solidarity in the workplace looks like how we understand that that's not that's a that's sort of a black and white description of a problem that there's many shades of gray within that um we absolutely have what I would consider to be a merchant class which are you know not you know like they're doing okay they're doing well they're you know paying their bills they have a a good local business running but they're not amazon you know these people aren't suddenly millionaires um and they got involved in that business because they wanted to do something for their community okay that's very very different than um than a corporate entity that's playing lots of strategy on a more national or global context right and and that, like again we can have that discussion on a different date. But this is an opportunity for people who, you know, I, I would I would put this to my viewers that, you know, they they vote blue because that's who they most strongly identify with, right? But they don't necessarily feel well represented. OK. Those of us that just like stay away from from party politics. Um, I would encourage looking at like um, I mean, also I, it, it's it's hard. It, it's it's tough to look at sort of like the populist party as it existed, you know, and there's like there were absolutely some seriously horrible racial tensions within the populist party. Um when it f was first formed but there's it's it's also important to look at the why that was shut down was because it was really starting to like get at wrecking a system that protected wealth right and you know for anybody that thinks that gene's not out here 
trying to protect herself, protect her power, protect her position, protect her wealth. Um, I think it's just a, it's, it's short sighted, um, to, to view that it's, it's, it's naive. Um, because we all act out of self-interest always, uh, it just, that's, that's what we do. Um, we are never not in, we are never not subjective, right? No, there's no such thing as objectivity in, in a sense. Um, and so as much as we can say, we, you know, we advocate for things, the only way to truly approach objectivity, which I think of kind of like a, um, like a parabolic curve that's, that's going towards infinity, but never touches the line. Right. Um, we obviously are given a system where we have to choose an individual to represent us, which means we're putting our power in the hands of that individual. But we have a choice behind that to say, no, your office is going to be run by coalition, right? We, or we are going to put a candidate in who refuses to make a single decision that doesn't come back to their coalition based office to discuss and develop that policy, right? We have a choice to create campaigns that are structured around a progressive worker who doesn't have a lot of money. We can find ways to try and fund these people, to support these people, instead of waiting for some rich liberal like Gene or, you know, or even, you know, Mark Fernald to decide they feel like running because they have an issue that they're passionate about, right? That's... We're letting ourselves be represented by the few, right? It's like we're we're enabling this ideology that the few know better than the many. And we as citizens have the power to 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 reclaim that, right? Like we can we can take that right away. And it's my genuine belief that the way we do that is we really like, let's have a lot of conversations with each other about this. Like, let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about what we believe. Let's talk about what the difference between what I believe and you believe is fundamentally. Let's talk about why, why do I feel this way, but you feel that way? What experiences did we have that are so different that made us reach the points that we're at? And how, can, like, where do we agree? How can we sort of converge these ideologies and, and, and work with it, right? Um, and for, for us, I think through those discussions, we'll be able to identify like, hey, this is a great voice, right here this 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 person's voice is really good they really connect with people they really send a message and i feel like they listen to me and they'll say you know what i was wrong and i'll change and i'll grow or my understanding of this issue wasn't wasn't what it was uh or it wasn't where it should be and i'm gonna ad adopt those changes i'm gonna i'm gonna make them part of myself and i'm gonna move forward from there right we can choose to let those type of voices be the ones that are elevated we can create truly people-powered movements that that promote this type of 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 positive leadership but what it takes is for us to not excuse me be so apathetic about um about that process to think about it more in terms of we're going to take back our community we're going to really control our community you know that there are there are more of us that are workers than there are of them that are that are incredibly high paid bosses you know um i think of this this passage from 1984 when um when winston's sort of like pontificating on um on the proles and how he's you know 
he's talking about their um how if they if they just real like they could they could end it all they could end it all like that if they were just able to 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 see uh what was happening what they were going through if they weren't so pushed down by what big brother is 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 providing them and lying to them about whether it's like pornography that they think is illegal but really is being made at you know um what is it there the um i can't remember which ministry it is off the top of my head but like you know it's like he he describes so well in that moment right that like he can't even fault them like winston can't even necessarily fault the proles for doing this because it's like that propaganda is so much larger than them right it's so how do you dig yourself out of a hole that you don't even realize you're in um the cool thing is that we don't live in airstrip one right now there are parts of our society that are getting there but we still have the ability to speak that truth back to power without just without just categorically getting killed and then turned into an unperson and that's the difference in my view between us and what winston the the predicament that winston describes the proles being in in 1984 we have that power and i want so deeply like if if what i'm talking about here is is going over people's heads or you don't understand or you're feeling like oh god this is frustrating and i'm just so like done with electoral pol politics and this bipartisanship and it's just just screw it like you know what man i hear you Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it more. Because we're all on that same side. We're all on that same side. And to sort of, you know, like, I, I'm going to cap the stream here in a second because I really, I don't want this to go too, too long. But um, I just sort of want to make one final point about, you know, about learn everywhere uh here in new hampshire and the people who are th the the way that learn everywhere is constructed right um it very much so places the power of decision making within the hands of elected officials as opposed to like a certain credentialed person that stands in and is like is uh you know acting in a, in a way like an ombudsman or something like that right um so i'll pull this up lastly just to sort of just just do it you know what i mean um so this is there uh this is the learn everywhere fact she i'll expand it a little bit um this sort of lays out what what applicants need to do all applicants will be first reviewed by a team that includes the administrator of office of academics uh, professional learning department of representatives with relevant content competency competency expert representative from the extended learning opportunity network and at least one state licensed educator in the content area right so it then goes on to say that it, it the application passes must be approved by the the state board of education uh program inspected by the department of education state board these all of these institutions 
that monitor, that assess, that control, that approve or deny opportunities, right? Like, or, or programs or, or things. They're, they're subject, okay, to the political perceptions of the people who are on those boards, right? Because it's very, very difficult to, you know, unless you're like, you're literally hiring some sort of scientist who says, I, 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 I don't care if it, it, if I agree with it or, or disagree with it, that has nothing to do with whether or not the fact is sitting in front of me. You know, it's like, like an, a numbers provider, people that just purely make decisions based off of their statistics, which again, I don't necessarily think is always the great way to go. But in this instance where you have to have some sort of broad standardized thing you sort of need that control measure right you got to have that 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 choke point that that funnels it and says yeah we're gonna strip like we, we need to put this through some sort of like mechanic right but the problem is that with these systems the way those those mechanics work right this is it's it's not unbiased okay um it's like it's a lot like what i was talking about last time talking about the the um police standards and training council how there's only two members of the public on that board right like two non-justice system related people that are just completely outside of it and that means that the system itself is protecting itself, right? It's 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 maintaining people with that specific understanding within it, with without some sort of a objective like whoa kind of a, a step. Um, and this isn't a whole lot different, in a sense. Be, but it's but there's there's a different nuance to it because again, those people that get into those boards, those people that sit there, right? Most of them are part of that PMC, right? Professional managerial class. And the decisions that they'll make, whether they realize it or not, are in a way based off of what they need and what they're seeking and how to maintain and and not sacrifice it, right? And, you know, we cannot expect every leader to just like every 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 business owner let's say to say to themselves you know what i'm going to pay myself the same as i'm going to pay my workers we can't trust that and if that's the case then why would we think it would be any different with with our elected officials so I just want people to consider like their own subjectivity as part of that process, right? And the best way that we can we can kind of quell that subjectivity is to make decisions as a community. So that's kind of my rant for today. And I'm sure there's stuff I missed and I'll probably go back and when I watch all this again and, you know, um, there might be more stuff that I want to add to it or things that I feel like I, I didn't articulate as well as I might have liked to um, and try and recorrect those those statements. Um, because I admit that I am also learning here. You know, I'm not I'm not a perfect voice. I'm not a like. I still have a lot to learn. I still have a lot to read. So with that, we're approaching an hour. I'm going to cap the stream for today. Uh, I got some phone calls to make. Uh, I do want to sort of like put out there that I about to speak with uh, Leif Seligman, uh, organizer of the protests here in our area. Leif's just a big advocate for restorative justice within the Monadnock region um founded uh Monadnock restorative community teaches writing um 
Leaf and I are talking. I, I I'm gonna try and get them on this week at some point. Um, hopefully, fingers crossed. Uh, to to go in depth on some of these models of like, okay, so a lot of the stuff that I just talked about today. What are what are material things that we can organize together and do and talk about and make happen to to unite on a racial, a gender, you know, sexual orientation, worker based. How can we erase those lines, connect with each other, find ways to to encourage us questioning ourselves and and each other in a in a way that's safe that allows us to grow so that's a conversation that i'm really looking forward to happening um huge shout out to lena barbosa for putting me in touch and that was just a really wonderful conversation i was so happy to have last week and i again if you haven't checked that interview out please i encourage folks to go and and hear what lena had to say because there is i i i cannot think of of more important points that would need to be heard by a white community here in in new hampshire 95 percent white community so thanks so much everybody for tuning in um again you can support us on patreon subscribe to the youtube channel hit the little bell down there for notifications you can do it straight through your gmail you don't have to have a specific youtube account like us on facebook follow us on twitter um and again you know please if this stuff, this content, these discussions, these videos that I'm posting, these interviews, if you feel like this is making a difference, I really encourage folks, please help support this. Um, a big part of the reason I'm able to do this right now is because I, I am receiving benefits that will expire. And when that happens, I... I do not know what my next step is yet, frankly. I'm working on it. I have I have sort of things that I'm working on, but it could well mean that I don't I don't do this as much. And or or and when I say not as much, I mean really like much, much, much less frequently. So, you know, if you feel like this is something that is is a positive thing for our community, if this is a resource that you like to see, please consider going to patreon.com slash locally sourced and and joining and subscribing uh we have several different tier levels that people can can chip in at you know the one i encourage folks is like five bucks a month you know it's it's a lot less than what you pay for the ledger transcript uh not that i'm saying you shouldn't support them but um but right now like i don't i don't put i don't have ads or sponsors this is 100 percent viewer based this is a way for us to have democratic information where where i am accountable to my viewers and to the public and i'll openly address that stuff and let people come on and challenge me and 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 i want to get into it because in my opinion i see this being the positive future of media as opposed to the negative ones that we're also accustomed to with what we see in the mainstream on cable news and and um and major national print publications or online publications so um that's my little spiel and you know what, like, I, I love being a part of this community. I do. As much as I have my problems <laughs> um, and I have my gripes, there isn't a place that I would rather be. And, and this is my home. And it's, it's all our homes, too. And, uh, like, everybody else's home. It's, this, is, this, is, this is where we're at and we can, we can do this we're we're in a place where we can pioneer these these positive ideas we can be leaders here for our nation and that's just something i want i i, I want folks to sit with so uh, on that note everybody have a great day probably be back on wednesday and um yeah and just take care and, and go get some fresh air all right have a good one folks